Hey guys, welcome to episode four of season one. Today's case is going to be a case that was in Canada. So I'm excited to do this case, but at the same time, this has always been a case that has stuck with me because for one, it's so unsettling and just makes me sick thinking about it and reading about it. But um, there is a part of this case that really stuck out to me ever since I had seen the um, documentaries on it and the interrogation. And it's mainly the interrogation that really stuck with me and is the reason why I am doing this case. Like I said, this is episode four. Thank you so much if you have been supporting my podcast and listening. I really appreciate it. If you do take the time to listen to this, make sure you jump over to my Instagram at Caffeine Crime Podcast and let me know what you think on the episode post. And you can follow me there. If you are listening to this right now on a podcast platform, I am now on Anchor, which is where I have set my podcast up and I have been loving. I'm also on Spotify and more platforms are to come. There may already be more by time this is up because I am pre-filming this one a little bit. But if you are listening, I also have a YouTube channel. So if you do like watching true crime videos a little bit more, you can also go check that out. And yeah. So this is the case of Russell Williams. Like I said, this is in Canada. Um, there's three different places in Canada, so three different towns that I'm going to be talking about in this case. So we have Ottawa, I think is how you say that. I could be wrong, and I'm sorry if you're from that area, if I'm butchering that. There's also Tweed and Belleville. So first, the story starts out with some parents and I don't I didn't even write down their names because they're not really a big part of the story the rest of this case so sometimes I like to leave some people with their privacy and not like say their names but some parents in Ottawa were away on vacation they had their teenage daughter with them and when they got back home um, their daughter had went up to unpack her bags, I'm assuming, and she realized when she opened her underwear drawer that all of her undergarments were gone. So she ran downstairs, she told her parents, and she said, um, I don't know where they're at, and they just replied with, oh, you know, she's a teenager, so they're probably in the hamper. She, you know, she packs them with her for vacation, the rest are probably around her messy bedroom floor, and kind of blew it off. So the girl was really concerned though, and she went back to her room, and that's when she realized that there were shoes in her room missing. All of her swimsuits were missing, and even photo albums that she got down from her shelf had pictures of herself missing from them. So they of course called the police then, because they were very concerned about who's targeting their daughter, and police came and they did find DNA on her dresser, but nothing ever came of it, they didn't know they didn't have a DNA match with anybody. They didn't really have any suspects. This poor girl, and like I said, she's a teenager, but obviously after something like that, or she couldn't sleep in her own room for three months and they never left her home alone. She always was with somebody and they were very precautious about their daughter. The same like activity of a break-in and burglary of undergarments from women's drawers kept taking place um, in the same area slash neighborhood from 2007 to 2009. So that's like three years of these mysterious break-ins every few weeks from different houses. There's so many houses that were broken into and just random stuff that still was very like sexual was stolen. Strange enough, in a lakeside neighborhood that had cabin-like houses in Tweed, the same type of break-ins were happening during the same time and everything, and there was still no leads. But things took a turn in September of 2009. It was September 17th when a woman had put her eight-week-old baby to bed. She had walked back out of the room, and that is when she was attacked by a male intruder. This took place at about 1 a.m. She was sexually assaulted and photos were taken of her. Then he left about 3 a.m. The next day, September 18th, the same house, another break-in occurred. Thankfully, 
nobody was home that day. The next week, another break-in happens at the same exact house, and again, thank God, nobody was home. And then the last week of September 2009, there were two break-ins at a house close to that one. Nobody was home at that house either for both of those break-ins, but the person turned around and did a third break-in the following week at that house, and a woman was home alone when she was surprised by a male intruder who blindfolded her, cut off her clothes, sexually assaulted her, took photos for two and a half hours, and when she asked if he would kill her, he said, no need for that. She thought she had heard his voice before, but couldn't identify him. Like I said, this happened in Tweed. The word got around Tweed that a man was out preying on women. Police ambushed Larry Jones, who lived in this neighborhood in Tweed, and told him that he was a suspect. He lived in Cozy Cove neighborhood, and the woman that said she recognized a voice said it could have been him. He was interrogated for three hours, fingerprinted DNA testing, and another three-hour polygraph test, and weeks of follow-ups, all for them to say that he wasn't the guy. Neighbors still didn't trust him and looked at him as a predator. And then in mid-November, Ann Cook was home in Belleville getting ready for her birthday party that evening. It was going to be at her friend's house nearby, so she went home and she thought that she was home alone. She rushed up the stairs to change. In the bedroom, she went to her dresser and noticed that her bedside table drawer was open. And lo and behold, what was missing from it was some sex toys. So I don't know what the situation was. I think Anne was living by herself at this time, um, but I think she was dating her husband at the time. So they were just dating, but I don't think they lived together. And I'll tell you why in a minute. But Anne went on. She thought it was weird. She went ahead and changed, got ready, and she left. So when they had come back to the house, she was with her now husband. And the reason I think they were maybe just dating at the time, or I don't really know, but I don't think he was. they were living together because he told her, you know, they joked about it, haha, ha, funny, that, you know, somebody really broke in and that's, you know, what they took or whatever, and just kind of, you know, laughed about it, whatever. And he still was just kind of like unsure about it. He said, I don't want you staying here tonight. Let's lock up the entire house. Make sure you lock all the deadbolts with your key. And then you can, I guess, come stay with me or whatever the case was. The next day when she came home, she had to go to her office to get a few things before work that day. I'm just going to keep calling her her husband because I don't really know what they were at this time. But he was in another room. She was in her office and she screamed. He ran into the room and her one of her computers in her office that she said had been turned off for like a couple years now like they weren't even using that computer it was on and there was a screensaver on the computer that lit up the whole room and said go ahead call the police i want to show the judge your really big dildos so although it was kind of like a laughing matter of a sentence to her it was like oh my god somebody was here again they had locked the deadbolts and everything. How could somebody else got in? So she ran to her room only to realize that drawers in her dresser were empty. And these drawers happened to be undergarments and swimsuits and random stuff like that. That was all in the same category. She was so shaken up because whoever it was that was there had to have been there when she was there. So they must have been hiding in a closet or in a room somewhere while she was there changing and joking about this matter on the phone with her husband. So freaky, but he must have heard the conversation and then stolen her stuff, went and typed that on her computer and then left out the door that was deadbolted. She mentioned to the Belleville police when they came out to her house that she had been following up on the similar stories in Tweed and in Ottawa. They let it go. They brush it off like it wasn't really a connection. Then on November the 25th, the body of Corporal Marie France Kamua, I, I don't know if I'm saying her name right and I really apologize. I'm going to be calling her uh, Marie France for the rest of this, but she was 38. She was a military flight attendant and she was discovered inside of her house dead. At first glance, it looked as a suicide, but later was ruled homicide. She was strangled, 
and nobody really had leads on what had happened, but there was definitely sexual abuse and that involved. Then on January 28th, 2010, so now we are in 2010, a 27-year-old Jessica Lloyd came in from a night out and texted a friend saying, I'm calling it a night, you know, just pretty much saying good night. I'm going to bed now. I got work in the morning, that type of ordeal. It was around 1030, which was normal to her friends and family because she had work the next day. This is where the story really took a turning point and a very good way for the police to identify what was going on here. So at 3 a.m. that night, two men were driving a truck. I'm assuming this was like a big like diesel truck because they were taking a load. They were driving through Belleville and past Jessica's house. So Belleville, I'm a, from what I've understood from this, was in between Ottawa and Tweed. So they passed her house and thought it was strange that a truck was parked in a field right next to her house. And both of the men kind of looked at each other and even said, that's weird. Why? I mean, there's a vehicle by this person's house, but why do they have a truck? Or like an SUV almost. I don't think it was a truck. I th yeah, I think he drove an SUV over in the field. And, you know, they just kept on with their truck load. Later that day, Jessica's family was contacted that Jessica never made it to work. Her brother went right over to her house. All of her belongings were there without her, and she was missing. A search and rescue was on. Larry Jones said his neighbor, Larry Jones was the one in Tweed that had been accused of being the man's voice that the woman thought was him. So we're back to him. But Larry Jones had said that his neighbor came over to him and asked what he was up to one day. And Larry was obviously dressed in his hunting gear and had all of his hunting stuff ready to go. He told him, I'm going out to hunt. He said, you know, I like to go over by the golf course. And his neighbor asked him, where exactly was that located? So Larry told him, oh, it's out on Cary Road. Kind of strange to Larry because he never really talked to his neighbor, but he kind of just brushed it off. This is a little bit more important later on down the line. The two men that were driving that night were coming back from taking the truckload and had seen Jessica's face on the missing posters. They didn't know that that was Jessica's house with the SUV until they passed by and seen tons of news people, tons of officers and search parties out at her house and they put two and two together that that was Jessica Lloyd's house. They went straight to the police and told them about the SUV that was parked in the field. Thankfully, the police were able to preserve the tire tracks that were left in the field. And that is when the police made stops around that area in between Ottawa and Tweed to check tires. One of them happened to be Russell Williams. They checked his tires and they let him go, but he was officially marked as a person of interest to watch because the tire tracks match and he was one of few. On February 7th, 2010, Russell was at his home in Ottawa when he was called in for questioning to which he assumed was about his neighbor Larry and Tweed because Russell Williams happened to own a house in Ottawa where his wife stayed most of the time but they also owned a cabin-like house in Cozy Cove Lane and Tweed. Police thought it was kind of weird that not only was he in both areas that all of these um, burglaries were going on, but also the fact that tire track matched and the fact that the road he took from his Ottawa house to Tweed house was right past Jessica Lloyd's house. But again, Russell was very laid back, nonchalant, kind of like a a guy that just kind of is just like, you know, I'm not in trouble, you know, type of ordeal. He thought, oh, they're just going to ask me some questions about this Larry guy. And this is the part where this case always stuck with me because also Officer Jim Smith, I think is his name. I really hope I got that correct. You can watch his interrogation video. I'm actually going to link it in the blog for this case. If you're new to my podcast, I post a blog every single 
um, week when an episode goes up of anything that maybe I missed or somebody has clued me in on. And I also include pictures and links and stuff like that that I think would be helpful for people to understand this case a little better. I'm going to link the interrogation in my blog because it is unreal how this um, Officer Smith does. He is very calm and collected and he's very straightforward but very um, polite in a way of being stern but not hateful. And it's just so like crazy watching his tactics of slowly breaking down Russell, which took nine hours in a small interrogation room. But he finally cracked Russell, who admitted to all the burglaries, all or the two women who were killed, and you know, another break in at Ann Cook's house. But it was the whole atmosphere of it. It never got really heated or angry or anything like that. He kept him very calm while talking to him. And it was just like, in the end, it was just like, I'm busted, you know? In the end, he handed him his notepad and pen and told him to write down everything. And the next day, Russell took them to Jessica's body. Her body was found right off Kerry Road in Tweed, Larry's favorite hunting spot that he had asked Larry about. So really, when that body was found, if Russell had gotten away with this, this would have been the perfect place to set up Larry to go to jail. And to this day, Larry thinks that if it wasn't for those tire tracks and Russell being brought in for questioning, Larry would have been locked away for this. They went to his house. I, I don't even really want to talk about his wife. I'm going to give her some privacy. I do find it strange that she wouldn't have known because what they found were boxes and boxes of undergarments, swimsuits, photos, and a journal where he wrote down where each piece of clothing came from, the date, and everything. Not to mention in the report, he apparently wore these undergarments for photos, so he was quite the character. He was charged with two life sentences, and that was for first-degree murder, sexual assault, forcible confinement, and breaking and entering. But what I want to go back and talk about was this, these events that happened because what I didn't mention is that Russell Williams was the commanding officer in Canada's Air Force. He was even a pilot for the Queen of England at one time. Everyone that knew him said he was such an amazing guy and he would do anything for anyone. He was raved about for all of the events and charity work he would do that he would show up for. So on September 17, 2009, when the woman had put her eight-week baby down and then was attacked in her house, that same day, Russell was at a base attempting to set a Guinness world record of pulling an airplane. You'll notice that every single time something happened, the next night that there was a break-in at the same exact house, he was busy at an opening day of some like high school hockey season, being such a great guy, doing the opening and dropping the first puck and just being acknowledged for that. Every time a break-in happened, it took place on a day where he was being acknowledged somewhere. The woman in Tweed who asked if he was going to kill her and she said, and he said no need for that, and she thought she recognized his voice, it was because Russell stayed in Tweed most of the time and his wife was in Ottawa most of the time. So it was like the perfect way for him to get away with this kind of stuff. The police came out and went door to door after that lady was attacked. And when they got to Russell's door, he didn't answer. It was like he wasn't home. So when they went next door to poor Larry's house, they asked about him. He said, oh, he's a commanding officer at the Air Force. The police shrugged and said, oh, well, there's no sense in looking into that then. Little did they know that they could have stopped this and even stopped two women from being killed at this point. But sadly, like I said, on November 25th, Corporal Marie France was found dead in her house. What I told you guys was that she was a military flight attendant, but what I didn't tell you guys was that she had actually flown before in the same plane as Russell because he was a pilot. So he knew her and he had planned that 
he seeked her house out in Belleville and knew exactly who she was. And like I said before about Jessica Lloyd, she lived in Belleville right between Ottawa and Tweed. So he had to pass her house to get to each of his houses. So that was another one that was just planned out. And when the woman said that the voice was Larry Jones, he jumped on that, trying to plant his second victim's body in his favorite hunting place to try to frame an innocent man for committing these crimes. I'm not really sure whatever became of his wife. Um, if she filed for divorce, God, you would hope so. Um, she never came public with anything. She never wanted to be, it was always just a no statement um, for her. Why Russell decided to start killing, I'm not sure after all the attacks that he had done. I don't know if these women maybe um, were stronger than what he thought and fought back and seen who it was, or maybe even for Marie France, maybe she even recognized his voice and knew exactly who it was. Like always, my heart goes out to the victim's friends and family. It is so awful. And props to Jim Smith for that interrogation. It was amazing. Like I said, definitely, if I was to recommend any interrogation video, it would be that one. It is just amazing how his tactics are and getting this man who you can tell is just kind of cocky, just has that attitude, but getting him to crack under pressure and such a like, I don't know, maybe it's a Canadian thing. Maybe they're not like as riled up as Americans. I don't know, <laughs> but it was just such a calm thing, but he did such an amazing job. But like I said, he was charged for first degree murder, sexual assault, forcible confinement, and breaking and entering. He is now life in imprisonment. And despite being on suicide watch at some time after he was caught trying to force a cardboard toilet paper roll down his throat to choke himself, he is still serving time because he was caught doing it and they unfortunately saved him. But at the same time, I guess it's been real hell for him in there. But that is pretty much a wrap on this one. I feel like my episodes are kind of getting shorter and shorter. I apologize, but um, I guess I'm just getting better at my note taking so I can kind of get to the point with everything. Oh, well, now that I'm thinking about it, I forgot that John Bonet's was last week and I haven't edited that one as I'm filming this one. So that one is probably long, but... <laughs> If you guys haven't checked out that one, make sure you do jump on my YouTube and watch it or go ahead and go to my previous episode. I would super appreciate it. And like always, if you have any comments for this case, if I forgot something or missed something, please let me know over on at Caffeine Crime Podcast. You can comment on the post for this episode. It'll be season one, episode four, Russell Williams. And you can let me know what you think or let me know what to add to my blog. If I miss something, I would appreciate it. And I know everybody else would too. And make sure you go check out the blog that will now be up with all of that information if there is some that I forgot to mention here. As well as pictures and all of that because I usually like to throw those in the mix. But I hope you guys enjoyed this episode four. I will be back next Tuesday with episode five. So I appreciate it. Thank you guys so much for listening and I will be back next Tuesday. Yeah.